Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. Well, amen. God's good. Praise God. Uh, I just want to make one announcement while they're passing the buckets around that next Sunday we're having a picnic here. And we got a lot of things planned. I don't know what all it is, but we're going to have a great time. We're going to eat a lot of food and uh, get to talk to each other and uh, do a lot of great stuff. So that's next Sunday. And so is there anything else I should say about it? Just ride horse, ride. Uh, kids will have water. Give them a cup of water. And so water slide. Help me out here. Anything else? All right. <laughs> What's that? Oh, bring a dish to share. So anyways, it's well organized, you can tell. So <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them with me, please, to, um, to what verse? Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2. Um, I, I titled this message, I titled this message, Captured by the Culture. Captured by the Culture. I don't know if it's culture is a very good word to use, um, but it's something that all of us are affected by. Oh, by the way, my, my sister-in-law is here. This is Trisha's sister, Val. She's here from Pennsylvania. Um, she's a, her and her husband for years were uh, Bible school professors and um, uh, high ups in the Bible school thing. And uh, uh, I can't remember titles very good, but it was, they were really important. Like he's like a doctor of divinity uh, in the assemblies of God. So. You can meet her afterwards. And, and now they're doing, uh, what is it, Phi Alpha? Chi Alpha Ministry, which is a college outreach ministry on, on college campus. I know they're on in uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, some other colleges. Temple and what? And Drexel. So uh, that's out east there in the um, stronghold of whatever out there. <laughs> so anyways, I want to talk to you this morning about so make sure you say hi to her afterwards. So captured by the culture. Culture is something that every one of us, we feel it and we're affected by it, even though we can't explain it. It's like it's something that is unseen. You can't really see it. But all of a sudden, you just kind of feel it. You walk in. Every one of us carries a culture around with us. A lot of it depends upon our thinking, the thoughts that we have. We have a culture in our head. Some people's head culture in their head is not that great. And some people uh, have a pretty good culture in their head because they entertain the right kind of thoughts. And so all of us carry a culture and then we also are affected by culture. Uh, Ken, uh, Kevin Leal, he said this, that culture, and I always struggled with this statement, but I'm gonna say it anyways, because it seems a little extreme. But he said that culture is stronger than the anointing. And uh, I always thought, nah, I don't think so. But actually, I said that because I want you to understand how strong and how powerful culture has the effect that it has upon our lives. You know, I, I don't know, but I've always been fascinated by, like, people who do extreme things, you know, like crazy things, like suicide bombers. You know, like they take, get this, they take a bomb, they strap it on themselves, they go over someplace and push a button, blow themselves up, and try to kill a bunch of people. It's like, what in the world were you thinking? You know, don't you wonder about that sometimes? What are you thinking? Because it's totally against human nature for a person to be that self-destructive. Because we, self-preservation is a very strong force. And so when a person will deliberately do that, uh, it seems very strange. But the point is, is that I always think about this, what kind of culture is that person growing up in that causes them to do something that's that extreme? Because they didn't just sit there one day all by themselves and just come up with this crazy idea. But they were immersed in some kind of a culture that brought them to this fr uh, frizzy point, uh, point of frizzy, how do you say that word? Uh, you know, uh, frenzy point where they would do, thank you, Sister Cornemone, they would do something that extreme. 
And so whether or not we realize this, we're being affected by culture. And that can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. You know, the early church, one of the things that it says about them, and in fact, let's look at this verse before we look at Ephesians chapter 2. Look at this verse. I didn't have this one on the thing, but you guys can find your Bible, right? You still have Bibles, right? I forgot mine at home because I got this iPad and I have all the Bible on here. But listen to this. In Acts chapter 2, it says that with many other words, he testified and exhorted him, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation, this crooked or untoward generation. So in other words, he said, Save yourself from this crooked or this untoward generation. In other words, he's talking about the culture. He said, the culture that you're in right now, he said, save yourself from it. Because you got to remember, that was the culture that crucified Jesus. And so when you're a religious culture, and you say that you believe in God, and when God comes down in a physical form and walks among you, and you kill him, there's something wrong with this culture. How many can solve all of that? There's something seriously flawed about this culture. And so he said, save yourself from this untoward, or this crooked, or this perverse Culture. And then if you read on, it says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. About 3,000 souls were added to the church. And then it says this, They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Notice it says they continually were under the teaching of God's word, apostles' doctrine, under the teaching of God's word. They fellowshiped together. In other words, they were in fellowship with each other. They broke bread. They had each other over for dinner, and, and they broke bread together. And uh, what was the last thing? It says, and they were pray they prayed together. So that's the they create. How many can see they created a culture among themselves that was uh, that was actually very positive, very good. It goes on to say that fear. Look at verse forty three. Then fear or awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all that believed were together, had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among anyone who had need. Now think about that for a second. It says that when people came around them, they had this sense of awe. There's like, what is this? What is this I feel? It's the culture. You can't put your finger on it, but it's the culture. And out of that culture produced some things. First of all, signs and wonders and miracles. But also it produced this giving where people would actually, somebody had a need, they say, well, you have a need? They would sell, like you need, back then it'd be like, you need a donkey? I got two donkeys. I'll give you one. And so they, they had this giving environment, had this giving atmosphere, and it wasn't something that the leadership of the church uh, dictated to everybody, said, you got to do this, you got to do that, but everyone just kind of felt it. They just had this, they, they were in this culture and because they saw somebody that had need, they said, it's not right for me to have, I'm storing stuff up here. You have a need, I'll give you some of my junk. You know, it's awesome, right? And so that was the kind of culture. And so can you imagine if you, if you grew up, if our, let's think, of, think about a second, if our kids grew up in that kind of a culture, where the kids, because how many know that kids are affected by culture? So sometimes, you know, I see, I look at a, I see a kid, you know, like I could tell you stories and all you could tell stories too. It's like you're in a public place and some kid's melting down. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And, and the mothers go over there, honey. And the kid's going, shut up, you know, and just screaming and go, you go, there's something wrong with this culture, right? You're thinking about this kid's growing up in the wrong kind of, did I just say the wrong thing? I know you're never supposed to talk about kids. In church, you're never supposed to talk about kids. I realize that. So just forget about that example. But what I'm trying to say is, you can see sometimes by looking at people and you can, you can tell what kind of culture. You know, um, I remember I heard this preacher one time. He said this, and, and um, uh, we, were at, we, were, we were actually up north and we were fishing, and some people heard that we were, were there and they came over and they said, would you, uh, would, you pray, would you pray for our children? And the children came in and they were kind of like, oh, they were all snarly inside. And, and, uh, he's, and this guy said, that is a that church and that family is, that church is very unhealthy. I said, how can you tell this that church is unhealthy? Just he said, look at the kids. Look at the kids are growing up in a culture. The kids are in church. They're growing up in a culture, and that culture kids don't know enough to act. Fake, they don't know enough to fake it. So they just act out whatever instincts or whatever whatever is forming them. They just act it out. And so if they're not in the right culture, they they 
they get crazy. I know I should, I'm going to stop talking about kids right now because that's not my subject. But what I'm trying to say is that Jesus wanted us to create a culture. He said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples because you have love for each other. In other words, he said they would come, sinners would come around you and they'd go, holy. You keep, is holy cow a bad word for our praise? Holy cow or holy smokes or whatever, whatever the holy. They just go, That's, this is amazing. They sense it in the atmosphere. And I want you to see this also. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but I want you to see that God and even, and God is attracted by culture. When we create things, it says in the Old Testament, it says that when brethren, how, how wonderful it's when brethren, when Christians dwell together in unity, then it starts talking about this incredible anointing that comes on the head and it goes all the way down and it totally saturates the atmosphere because God is attracted. That's why the Bible says where there's envy and strife, there is what? Confusion in every evil work. So what, what does he say? Where's the envy and strife? In other words, the culture, the atmosphere is envy and strife. What does it produce? It produces something, confusion in every evil work. And so if you reverse that, you say uh, where there is love and unity and acceptance and there's these positive things, what does it produce? It produces clarity in every good work. And so you get a, you get a bunch of people that, first of all, in their head, in their head, they think the right thoughts. They think the right thoughts. They meditate on the right things. They carry that culture around. And then they begin to express that culture to other people. And it creates that kind of culture in the atmosphere. What happens is God shows up. God shows up on things and things start happening. Like you can't believe. How many can see what I'm saying? And so it's so important for us to create the right kind of culture in our homes it's important for us to create the right kind of cultures in our church, in our relationships, because culture will form you. It forms you, and it forms your children. It forms everything about you, and it's very important to have the right kind of culture. You know, this is another extreme example. I don't know. There's an expression that we use sometimes when, we, when people are gullible. We say they drink the Kool-Aid. How many ever heard of that expression, they drink the Kool-Aid? Well, I remember where that came from. Do you guys know where it came from? See, I'm young enough or old enough where I remember I was alive when that started. And what it was is this guy named Jim Jones. He, he, um, he brought a bunch of people to, to this uh, socialist utopia in Guyana, South America. And he, he was going to build this utopia on earth. And so what happened was a bunch of events happened. He convinced, now just get this, he convinced I think it was over 800 people to drink cyanide-laced Kool-Aid. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, there, there is no way on God's green earth I'm drinking that Kool-Aid. How about you? I mean, there is no way. You are all nuts, so I am out of here. That is not going to happen. But I say that because I'm living in this culture. Right? I'm not live, I wasn't living in that culture. If I was living in that culture, I mean, I can't see myself doing this, but I'm going to go over there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Can you see yourself doing that? I ain't doing that. But that's because you're living in this culture. But they put themselves in a culture that so formed their values and their ideals and, and ideas that when it came time to say, and, and I guess they knew it, I mean, it, parents gave it to their kids. What kind of a nutty situation is this? But it's, it, it was a culture that they created that they were so uh, uh, enslaved to that guy's thinking that they did what he asked them to do. And so it's so important for us that we examine the culture. What, what are the thoughts? And that's why scripture is so important because there's all kinds of different ideas um, that come down the pike, and we have to examine these ideas in the light of Scripture because Scripture will create a healthy environment, first in your head and then in our midst. How many can see what I'm saying? And so, and so a culture is so vitally important. Now, let me say a couple more things here about culture I think that are important. 
And uh, because the culture, like I said, that we live in forms who we are. It's sort of like this. I was going to do this, but I'm not very good at, you know, the kids. We have grandkids now. We play Play-Doh. You know, Play-Doh. You know what that is, Play-Doh? So we play Play-Doh, but I, you know, I'm supposed to form something. But it, my, my, everything I form, my horse looks like a, looks like a dinosaur. And, you know, it, nothing looks that good. So I was going to do this for you. I was going to put a piece of clay on the table, and then I was going to use my hands and begin to form it to, to give you a picture of what it's like, what, what culture does. It forms you and forms you into something based on what the culture is. It's like unseen hands that go into your life and begin to form your life. And don't think that you say, well, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go here. I'm not going to go there. Uh, but wherever you go, culture is there to, for is there to form you. You know, I was talking to this lady. My dad passed away a few weeks ago, and so I've been doing some of his business. And so I had to go to a bank where there's to do some of his business. And so the lady was sitting there, and, and she was talking. And, and so I started witnessing to her. I started talking to her about Jesus. Well, she, she had been raised in like a historical Lutheran. I said the wrong word. But anyway, so a historical church. And she was, she was turned off by religion. And, uh, and so she, um, she said she didn't go to church. So I started talking to her about Jesus, accepting Christ into her life. And she goes, oh, actually, I did that. I said, you did? When did you do that? She goes, uh, when I was a teenager, I had a friend that would invite me every summer to a Baptist, oh, a youth camp. <laughs> and I try not to say any names, you know, just stick to generic statements. But anyways, to a youth camp where they taught being born again. And she said, I went forward and received Christ into my life. And so I'm a believer. I said, oh, that's awesome. That's wonderful. I said, well, what church do you go to? Well, she goes, I don't go to church. I said, you don't go to church. She goes, no, my husband, he was raised in a historical <laughs> church background. And they crammed religion down his throat. And he said, uh, when he got done with one of their programs in that church, he said, I am, when I'm done with that, I'm never going to church again. So he never has really gone to church except funerals and weddings. But so he goes, we, we just, we, we, don't, we don't go to church. I said, you should go to church. She goes, I know I should. We should. And I was telling her about some churches that I knew in Minneapolis that are good churches. And, and then I looked and I noticed that she had a picture of her, her husband, you know, her and her husband, and their, they had two girls. And I said, oh, you have two girls. Yep. I said, well, what about your girls? I said, what about them? I mean, aren't you concerned that they're going to grow up and not know about God or not hear about God. They're being raised in a non-church going family. Aren't you concerned about that? She goes, well, I'm raising my kids. Now listen to this. This is a statement. I'm raising my kids to think for themselves. And I want them to grow up and I want them to make their own decisions. And then we got interrupted because I had a comment on that statement. Because your kids, listen, your kids are not growing up in a neutral environment. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? They are being... Pressure. You ever heard of peer pressure? They're being pressured. Pressure is being exerted on them constantly from people around them, from social media, from movies, from television, from every crazy, nutty person on planet Earth are be able to, every guy that's sitting in his underwear in his mother's house in the basement tapping out little crazy stuff. I mean, they're all pressuring your kid to conform to some crazy idea. And if you don't do something or, or try to form them, society will oblige you, let me tell you, and they will form them into a little heathen that doesn't know God and doesn't care about spiritual things. And all he'll live after is after his own personal lustful desires and every crazy idea. He might end up in some Guyana in South America somewhere drinking some uh, uh, cyanide lace Kool-Aid going, I think this is the way to go, you know, and, you have, to, you, ha you have to apply scripture to your child's life. Now, the Bible says about Timothy, Tim Paul said, Timothy, from a child, you have known the holy scriptures that make you wise unto salvation. He said, you knew it from a child. And we, have to, we can't just say, well, I'm just raising my kid to think for himself. He, come on. Nobody thinks for themselves. Everybody is influenced by what they hear. You just got to make sure they hear the right things. You got to live the right life in front of them. I'm getting off of kids right now, but you got to live the right life in front of them. And then you got to make sure that he hears the right things. She, he, he, right? 
Otherwise, he'll be crazy. He'll be crazier than you can imagine. And so we have to create these kind of cultures. So let's get to my sermon now. That was, none of that was my sermon. All of that was just warming my engine up. Now I'm going to get to my sermon, and it's quite lengthy anyway. So, no, I'm, I'm actually almost done. So f- turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. And let's look at what Paul said here. Let's see if I can get this sermon to work. I'm trying to do my best because Val's here, and she's going to go home and tell Phil that Steve didn't do very good. He crashed and burned. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to leave a good impression. So I'm struggling, struggling up here. So look at Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at this verse. It says, and although you were dead, everybody say the word dead. Yes. Now, how many know that when he's, he's writing to, Christ, to people, actually Christians, that we're not physically dead? They were not physically dead. So he says, although you were dead, when he says that, the word dead does not mean physically dead, but it means spiritually. You were spiritually dead. Your spirit, you were spiritually separated from God. That's what death means, separation. You were dead in your tra- transgressions and sins in which you formerly lived according to this world's present path, according to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the ruler of the spirit, that is now energizing the sons of disobedience, among whom also all of us formerly lived out our lives in the cravings of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. So he's describing their life before they came to Christ. And he says, you were dead in trespasses and sin. You were separated from God. But then he goes on to describe other things about their life. He said, They lived according to the world's present path. So in other words, there there are philosophies that create culture in this present world. And he says, you are in tune with it. You listen to it. You live by it. Like when I was a young man, one of the philosophies that was floated was, if it feels good, do it. How many ever heard that one? If it feels good, do it. Let me tell you this right now. If it feels good and you do it, you'll be crazy. Right? You'll, you'll, I don't want to get into too much here, but you, you'll weigh a thousand pounds. Because <laughs> right now I'm feeling Dairy Queen. I'm feeling, I'm feeling a mega blizzard right now. That's what I'm feeling right now. How would you like some broccoli? I'm not feeling broccoli right now. I'm feeling, I'm feeling ding dongs and ho hos. The whole, ca- I'm, I'm feeling a pie, a, a, whole, a, a pecan pie with honey coated pecans on it. That's what I'm feeling right now with pie a la mode. How many know if you, if you, if you feel it, if you do it, you're going to be crazy. But that was a philosophy that was floated. And so what he's saying here to these people, these Christians, in your past life, you live by the philosophies of the world. You know, that's why this lady said to me, in fact, the reason I, th- I thought so much about this, what this lady said to me, I'm, I'm raising my kids to think for themselves, choose for themselves, is I had two ladies in one week tell me the same thing. Another la- I was visiting some other people, and they said, well, I said something about they had a new baby, and I said, oh, well, are you going to bring the, you know, I always, I'm in church work, so I always bring church into it. You know, hey, how about church? You know? And they said, well, same thing. I'm going to raise my kid to think for himself. But they're not going to think for them. You know, here I'm going to say it again. They're not going to think for themselves. They have so many influences that are going to shape and form their world that you better be a major voice in their lives. And that's one thing about my dad. I, I told you that last week, that he was a major voice in my life, in my head. You know, I married my wife. You know, one of the main, main reasons that, you know, we were... Uh, I decided that this is the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. Because my dad said, he put his stamp of approval on her. He said, don't lose that woman. Because Trisha and I had broke up. And, and I took another girl out and brought her home and, to meet my parents. Because I want to do the honorable thing. Here, Dad, what do you think of that? When I took her home, came back, my dad would go, what, what, what was that? And I go, well, it's, it's the girl. I don't know if he said it like that. But it was kind of the attitude. It was, you know. Where did that creature come from? Not, not that. He didn't say that, but 
kind of the attitude, you know. And, uh, boy, I hope the girl that I took out is not listening to this sermon. But anyway, so, <laughs> but anyway, so he said, he said well, you, know, you know, who's, and I go, well, you know, it's a girl I'm taking. He goes, hey, where's that girl, that real happy girl from Wilmer? Where is she? And I said, oh, you mean Trish? Oh, he kind of broke up. Oh, hey. He looked at me. He goes, don't lose that girl. Do whatever you can, but don't lose that girl. I go, really? Huh. And it made a major impact on my life. And so, vo listen, voices, you know, the right kind of voice will have a major impact upon our lives. And we got to have the right voices speaking to us. I don't know how I got into all that. What, what, what was I talking about? Anyways, I'll go back to this sermon again. So, uh, almost getting close to being done. So, he, he, what he's saying here is that he said, we were dead, you were dead in trespasses and sin. And then he said, he said, you walked according to the, the, the philosophies of this world, the path. Remember, we were last few weeks we've been talking about the way or the course or the direction of your life. Well, you were, you were marching in step with the philosophies, the values, the ideals of this world. You were marching in step with it. The problem, if you read the next line, he says, those ideas and philosophies come from the spirit of this age. In other words, they're not just like some guy, a free thinker, just sitting there. But actually, he said, a spirit speaks these philosophies, these ideas to people. They pick it up and they speak it out. I mean, have you ever noticed that some of the new ideas that are coming out are pretty nutty? I was... I don't, want, I don't like to be political, but can I just say one political thing? And if you don't like to hear it, just scratch it from the... I heard this one guy, he was a political candidate, and actually I, I was listening to a commentator, he goes, listen to this. And they quoted it, this guy gets on there, he goes, he's talking about transgender. He goes, so a guy who turned into a woman, okay, he was talking about this guy who turned into a woman, and he goes, if she wants an abortion... She should have the right to have an abortion, and we should have to pay for it. That's what she, he said, this, this said. And I'm sitting there going, eh, hello. <laughs> I hate to put this past you, but if he's born a guy and he turns into the woman, he can't have a child. <laughs> and... To say we'll ensure that he is, uh, has a, an abortion-funded abortion is so crazy. I can't even talk about it because he can't have a kid. But he stood there with a straight face and said that. But I'm just saying, that. I mean, I know that's extreme, that's cr crazy, but that's how crazy things get. That's why it's so important, so that's my last political comment, but... <laughs> But that's how crazy, see, they come, these ideas come from, and even if you're a Christian, you can get a thought attack. Have you ever thought about that? Like, you know, when your mind is not renewed on Scripture, do you know that worry and fear sound reasonable? Because, and most Christians, they think, well, because it came into my head, I'm supposed to think it. No, you're not. You're supposed to say, no, that's not based on Scripture. That's not based on the love of God. That's not based on the, the, uh, the protection of God. That's not based on the goodness of God. I reject that thought. You know, one thing that's happened to me lately is <laughs> I, was, I was going through some real serious stuff, really serious stuff. Like, I'd tell you about it, but it, you might get discouraged. But So I was really dealing with some serious, serious stuff. And you know what the bad thing about it was? Every time I looked at my clock or my watch, it said 9-11. Or 811. It always had the 11. I mean, I saw it like almost every day. I'd see, I'd look at a clock, and just as I looked at it, it was 811, 911. And this voice in my head would say, That's a warning, buddy. Tragedy is ahead. And so then I started thinking about that. Tragedy is ahead? I'd walk around with this voice in my head because, and everywhere, every time I looked at 911. Or 611, 511, 811. And this voice kept saying, see, I mean, you can't get away from it. I'm warning you. Finally, one day I said, I thought to myself, wait a second. Wait a second. This 
this is not, this is not faith-based. This is fear-based. This is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. This is not God. This is not his plan. This is not his purpose. This is demonic. This is a demonic attack. The devil just makes sure I see a clock at 9-11 or this. And so you know what I started doing? Every time I saw 9-11, I'd say, 9-11 on you, devil. <laughs> you going down. <laughs> it, things are looking bad for you. <laughs> Really, really bad. I mean, things are really, 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 I mean, like fire and smoke type bad for you, buddy. Your kingdom is coming to a not, coming to not, your kingdom is coming down. Amen. Amen. But to an unrenewed mind, fear seems reasonable. It's amazing that when I started saying that, I stopped seeing 9-11. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting, isn't it? So here's what he says. He says, says that this is your past life. He said you were dead. I mean, how many know that dead is kind of a, a permanent state? Right? I mean, it's kind of final. It's, it's kind of like the end. I've been around a lot of people that have died lately. But dead, dead is kind of the ultimate sentence. People who have died can't help themselves. They can't get better. I mean, you don't get better from dead. Well, he'll get better. No, you don't get better. I mean, when you're dead, that's it pretty much is. You don't mend. Your condition doesn't improve. And, and, and you can't be sort of dead. Well, he's sort of dead. What, <laughs> what does that even mean, he's sort of dead? He's dead. Right? You can't be kind of dead. How I many know that dead is pretty complete? It's, it's um, it, you don't, like your condition doesn't improve. I wrote down some statements about dead. Uh, you don't change course when you're dead. Dead people are helpless. Dead people are unreachable. And so that kind of describes when the Bible uses the word dead about your spiritual condition. It kind of puts you in that place. You, you, there's no hope for you. But I love the next verse. The next verse starts with, but God. I love that because but God, it just sounds like, yeah, but God. You know, it sounds like in your face, turkey, but God. You know, this is the final. It's over. There's nothing that can be done. But God. There, but God. But God. Yeah, there's something but, that can be done. But God. God, but God. But let me interrupt this process. But God. Lazarus was dead four days. And they go, it's over. They're all crying. <laughs> it's over. But God. And you might feel like you're living in a hopeless situation. Let me tell you this right now. But God. What about but God? Next, look at the next one. God who is rich. Rich in mercy. Rich, not just, you know, I, most people would write that and say, God who has mercy, but he says rich. Rich, all through the New Testament where that word appears, it means wealthy. It means you got a lot of it. God who is rich in mercy. Then listen to this next phrase. Because of his great love, great love, not just love, but great love, with which he loved us, even though we were dead in tra transgression, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up. No matter what situation you're in, he raised us up together. Raised us up together. That means your new birth came about because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That I, was, I came out of my spiritual condition because of resurrection power that came up, that, that that penetrated my soul, penetrated my heart, and raised me out of my, my condition. And that power can raise you out of any condition, any situation that you're in right now. That power can raise you up and bring you out of it. But God. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, but God. Give him that eye, too. Give him that but God eye. See, 
It says, but God being, being rich in mercy, being, how many know, when you, I looked up the word being, I thought it was a good word to look up. And the word being means existence, continual existence. It, 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 means in, it means existing in a perpetual state. God being rich in mercy, he, he exists in a perpetual state of, of being rich in mercy. You say, well, that's why it says in the book of uh, Lamentations, says his mercies are new every morning. So I got up this morning, looked out the window, mercies are new today. Brand new. I had a whole, I needed a whole truckload of mercy yesterday, new every morning. I need some mercy again today, yeah, new every morning. Mercy. Isn't that awesome? So as I conclude, let me just read you one passage. I didn't put this up there, but so here, here's the thing. So we have to create. We, we're creating a culture. See, he said that you came out of a culture that was influenced by the spirit of this age. You came out of that culture. And where that culture, it forms you and where it sends you is into destruction. That's where it will send you. Ultimately, it will send you into destruction. You came out of that culture. Now you come into a new culture. Where there's, where there's the word of God, where there's other Christians that love you, that care about you, that will speak into your life, that will accept you. You got a problem, they feel like they got a problem. They'll worship with you, they'll cry with you, they'll, they'll rejoice with you. You come into that kind of a culture and that's going to start to form you into being a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. That's why culture is so vitally important. There's a verse in Ezekiel chapter 16. I love this verse. It's verses 5 and 6. God is speaking. He says, no, I, no one pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you, I saw you struggling in your own blood, and I said to you in your own blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your own blood, live. And I read that, and I thought to myself, that's how I was. I was rejected. I was cast out. And I felt when the, every, the impact of what it's like to be dead in sins. Hopeless. It's the end. It's the end for you. And God walked by and said, live, live. And when he said, live, I came alive. Something happened inside of me. Something began to shift inside of me. I came alive. And that's what God wants to do for every single person. Let me just say this to you as I close. As the worship team comes, don't be captured by the culture. Listen, and don't be seduced by it. Don't be deceived in thinking that it's harmless. It's not. It's dangerous. It may seem harmless, but it's not. I could say some things, but I'd just get in trouble. But God, remember this, that God has a great plan for your life. He loves you. The Bible says that God demonstrated. It wasn't just that he says, I love you. He demonstrated that he loved you. In the person of Jesus, he came as a man and died for you. You're, you lived under the sentence of death with no hope, no help whatsoever. And he came by. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, I want you to take this. Well, I'm saying to you right now, I want you to take it as God walking by your life and saying, live, live, speaking life inside of you. Live, no longer be in that condition. Live, come to life in Jesus Christ. He loves you. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song. Sitting here in your presence. 
Let's all pray together. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Before I pray, I just want to ask you this one question with your head bowed. Is there anybody here? I'm going to pray in just a minute. Is there anybody here that you don't know Jesus? You don't know for sure if you died, where you would go, where you'd spend eternity, but you feel like, you know, I need to, God is calling you this morning. You feel like there's a draw in this sermon. You feel like God's drawing you and you'd like to receive Christ this morning. It's a simple prayer, heart opened up, simple prayer. If that's you, can I just have you lift your hand so I can see it, so I can include you in that prayer? Is there anybody here that you'd like me just to include you in my prayer as I pray together? Anybody? Just so I can see your hand, and I'll include you in my prayer. Anybody at all? Okay. Just felt like God was calling somebody this morning, drawing somebody. Just want to make sure that you were given that opportunity. Even if you're not ready right now, just know that God is calling you. God is calling you. Moments like this, he touches, he touches your life. It's like he's walking by and he's saying, live. But as that text said, he'll, he'll come again and say, live. Because your life is so precious to him, incredibly precious. He died so that you would not miss heaven. He died that you might be saved. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. Lord, I just thank you for this great people that you brought here today. In your eyes, they are the most precious thing on this planet. They're so valuable to you. They mean everything to you. Lord, I just pray by the Holy Spirit that you will just draw them, every one of us, whether we're saved or not, Lord, that you draw all of us closer to you. Just pray, God, that help us, give us grace, Lord, to create the right kind of culture here that's so attractive and so appealing that signs and wonders break out, that people are in a state of awe when they come. We just pray, God, for that kind of environment, atmosphere here. Thank you for helping us, Lord. On this great day, we pray. In Jesus' name. If you're here, I'd like the prayer counselors to please come forward right now, if you would. If you're here, we'd like prayer for any need. You have a need in your life. It's spiritual, mental, emotional, uh, whatever it is, physical. I'm going to give the opportunity for these prayer counselors to pray for you. As soon as I dismiss, we have some refreshments in the back. But please make your way to the front and let these people pray for you. Uh, it'll be awesome. You'll have a great, great experience. Amen. Well, God's good. And so please join us for some fellowship in the back. Other than that, God bless you. You're free to go. Have a great week. This message has been a blessing to your life. A copy of this message and additional Destiny Church materials are available at destinychurchexit77.org.